I love some urban myths, like the crocodiles in the sewers of New York. I see the city as an immense, partly submerged, an old reptile, and we humans as just temporary guests, rumbling on over the scales, pecking on its back here and there. R.P. Brown's Apex is an art project which examines the primal drivers of power, dominance and hierarchy which lie motionless beneath the crisp urban crust. The project reflects upon the two most prominent financial hubs of the Western world, London and New York. These cities are also some of the most unequal in the world. The project was shown in both cities in 2015. I started water in the aftermath years of the big financial meltdown of 2008, which threatened society with some form of extinction. This painting became the calling card of the project. Looking at water, the threat becomes apparent. What lies beneath, still and undisturbed, can dive at any moment and sink what's above. London is arguably one of the most interesting cities in Europe, and only a century ago was the centre of the planet. London's origins, though, are humble. It was founded in the first century on the swamps of the River Thames by the Romans. The original settlement looked after the interests of the Emperor in this remote corner of the Empire. London was the capital of the Empire where the sun never set, or equally, where there never was a sunrise. Like most metropolises, London works on hundreds of juxtaposed layers. For centuries, the real power, the financial institutions, remained in the shadows. But now its imposing presence is ever increasingly easy to spot, with dozens of corporate and speculative residential towers that are rapidly transforming the city's skyline. Thanks to the tourists, the old imperial character is very much alive like a phantom limb sensation holding a grip on people's imagination. In June 2015, R.P. Brown's Apex was exhibited in London at the Crypt Gallery. The venue is, is great. I really like what you did with sound and so on. That really added to it as well. The Crypt of St. Pancras Parish Church lies in the central borough of Camden, London. It was designed and used for coffin burials from 1822, when the church was opened, until 1854. During both world wars, the crypt was used as an air raid shelter. From the 7th of September 1940 to the 21st of May 1941, about one million houses were destroyed and more than 20,000 civilians were killed. On each of the 71 major German air raids, at least a hundred tons of bombs were dropped over the city. The crypt later became an art gallery in 2002 and now hosts a range of exhibitions and events throughout the year. The crypt gallery, with its low vaulted corridors, was literally beneath the urban crust and it had a foggy, primal character. 
During my first visit, I knew at once it was the right place for a show. I think it's very, very interesting indeed. The way that you've managed to bring the crocodile in with the four elements. Very appropriate, it seems to me, and also a lot of it seems to be New York, but some of it's London as well. Air evokes the Dutch tulip mania of 1637, one of the first financial collapses to be recorded. In Amsterdam, right before the crash, a single tulip bulb reached higher prices than a house. Ironically, the last giant bubble to burst was in the housing market. I think the um, earth was a favourite piece. While painting Earth, my mind was on the planet we inhabit. It gives us everything, protects us from roasting, and shelters us like a giant nest. The voracious system ruling the planet is eroding the pillars which sustain life. I just hope those pillars won't get too thin, or gravity will do the rest. I think my favorite one was fire. I thought that was pretty powerful. On the same page as Earth, fire depicts the exhausted urban planet. In this dystopian painting, the creature scales are the city blocks of Manhattan, scorching ambers and ashes. The picture is an inquiry into the use of energy and resources, in particular the abuse of fossil fuels. Yes, this thing the tent, I thought, There's one thing you can't find in nature, well, that is money. The other is the concept of time. It's very common to say, or hear, that time is money. But it really is the other way around, isn't it? Money is time. Your time. My time. Everyone's time. Ultimately, Money is a human tool to harness, stash, and trade time. Human time. When you see this, you start to wonder how the very few are able to own the time of the billions. I thought it was really moving. The public's response to the London show was very positive considering that the exhibition had hardly been advertised. It only took two corner banners on Euston Road to draw a constant flow of visitors to the gallery. The artist valued the visitors' diversity and their spontaneous reactions. I thought it was fascinating, actually. It was um, uh, open to a number of interpretations, I thought. Um, very evocative, uh, quite unsettling as well, very mind the subject matter. Yeah, very, very relevant. It was a little bit scary, but I think but it was kind of a good kind of scary. Like, it was something that was positive, that like, it helped. R.P. Brown is a painter, architect and designer. He was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in 1970, and he moved to Dublin in 2004, where he now lives. Art runs prominently through his family. Both his grandfather and his mother were painters. The work of the artist has stretched for over two decades. A long road which has often touched the topics of oppression and inequality. Between 1999 and 2003, Arpri Brown worked on NN The Regime, large acrylics on the subjects of war, mechanization, and imposition of a globally marketed society. Very aware of the hidden implications of the so-called globalization, the artist delved into the darkest pools of the 20th century to retrieve a whole set of shocking imagery. The resulting series was a statement against our commercially militarised present. 
In February and March 2003, R.P. Brown took part in the worldwide rally against the invasion of Iraq. As a demonstration placard, he took one of the triptychs, named the Conference of Hamburg, out to the streets. Months later, in November, the paintings were shown in the Holocaust Museum of Buenos Aires. At the opening, the artist met some of the attending survivors of World War II Holocaust. Unbeknown to the artist, but parallel to the show, the museum was endorsing Israeli settlements in Palestine. Once aware of this, he felt sad and reflected upon his own naivety. It would be years before he would consider showing work again. New York was originally a Dutch settlement on native lands, and for a long time it was called New Amsterdam. Trade transformed the original swamp in a sequence of boom and bust cycles. Today the city is a prime brand, selling itself over and over in tons of movies, advertisements and television shows. Well, London was a century ago, New York is nowadays only a hundred times bigger, taller, and faster. New York both impresses you and imposes upon you. Underneath the glamour of rags to riches stories lie only a few human fixations with power, dominance, and hierarchy. As an architect, I'm very familiar with skyscrapers as symbols of power, dominance, and hierarchy. But I think there's more to them, something more primal, greatly summed up in the film King Kong. Like a costly and useless attempt to escape from nature, and as well like a torn, unfulfilled wish to return to it. The Swamp series is a spin-off of the Elements paintings. The artist looked further into the predatory nature of the urban world. For this series, he used IKEA posters of New York City and turned them into acrylic swamps. For the second leg of the project, the artist was invited to the Argentinian consulate in New York. The consulate sits in a landmark building on 56th Street, 
just off Fifth Avenue, Midtown, and has a public art gallery. The New York space was the perfect opposite to the crypt in London. It was a large and formal space, very imposing, with a high ceiling and oak panelling on the walls. It truly felt like a portrait. I enjoyed the, uh, the exhibition in the boardroom with the uh, corporate characters and so forth. I love that you know the ones with the, the animals, you've used the, the suits, I really like that. <laughs> In November 2014, R.P. Brown made a short trip to Milan and bought cuts of top quality soup fabric. Milano shows its past and present power pretty much everywhere, with a robust and dominant architecture. Back in his Dublin workshop, he made the frames and carefully stretched the fabric for his next series of paintings, The Boardroom. In between R.P. Brown's London and New York shows, there was an incident involving Air France's top executives and some company workers who had recently been fired. The protesters broke into a board of directors meeting and tore off their clothes. The images were so shocking because in our daily lives we fail to see how such fabric can be torn so easily. I remember the photo of a man, clearly a powerful man, clambering the fence in rags, looking like a fallen bird of prey. And now he looks scared, vulnerable, and shock himself, as if some magic spell had been broken. Suits interest me because of the aura of power culturally assigned to them. The boardroom is all about hierarchy. I made portraits of top predators, mirroring their human counterparts. Predators seated within this boardroom were carefully chosen. Like a deck of corporate tarots, each canvas is full of symbolism. The main players and institutions at the apex of power are portrayed. Hereditary based institutions like monarchies and aristocracies, CEOs and corporations, rulers of the law, either human or divine, and the media. Although the original set was composed of seven portraits, two remain veiled at the time of the exhibition, the entertainment industry and the military corporation. Walking around Wall Street feels to me like being in the belly of the beast. By the way, it doesn't feel too different to City of London or Canary Wharf. In fact, they look more and more like each other. Like a beast with two heads. Some forms of life have been around way longer than our own species. But unlike us, their blood is cold. Which in human terms means no emotions, no empathy. According to science, one out of ten people can't feel empathy towards others. And no matter how well-dressed or charming, 
one out of these ten are really dangerous. That's one percent. quite a bit. It was entirely unexpected. I was just walking down the street and I, I was moved by the, the theme. I mean, or the boardroom. Um, I, I thought they were funny. I really liked what you did with the cloth. I, I thought that was a really interesting medium, I guess. Well, I was really struck, I think, by um, fire and, and water. It looked to me like a map of maybe outer boroughs or, you know, Manhattan's really, ex I didn't live in Manhattan, I lived across the Hawaiian rivers, uh, because you don't make enough to live in Manhattan unless you're in the boardroom. So Akin has delivered all the paintings along with Lucia, uh, his lovely daughter, from Dublin to London, safe and sound. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Perfect. Excellent. Holds the whole lot together. 